and hit that recording. Um, I always forget to record my intro. Oh, well. <laughs> so, uh, so welcome to our virtual program tonight uh, entitled Saving Black History Sites. Tonight, we're so pleased to welcome back Luana Holland Moore, Program Officer at the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. I say welcome back um, because we're lucky, we were lucky enough to have Luana as a colleague here at the museum several years ago. She was our membership and uh, social media person, and we very, very much miss working with her. So um, we are delighted that she um, landed at uh, such a, um, an important um, place with an important project and mission, um, but we do miss her. So um, as I said, uh, she's at the National Trust for Historic Preservation in the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Um, this is a multi-year $50 million initiative dedicated to identifying, elevating, and supporting the voices, stories, and places of African American activism, achievement, and community. The National Trust's, um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a line. Um, Holland Moore holds a BA in journalism and history from the George Washington University and a master's in historic preservation from Goucher College, where she wrote her thesis entitled Ethnic Minority Heritage Values and US Historic Preservation Significance Policy. Holland Moore was a researcher at the White House Historical Association and served on the National Trust's diversity and inclusion group representing Decatur House. Helen Moore worked for the Greenbelt Museum, as I just mentioned, um, and uh, as a DC native, um, she's a member of the Landmarks Committee of the DC Preservation League. She loves to talk to the public about preservation, African-American history, and marginalized cultural groups. And uh, we're just delighted to have her with us. Um, she's gonna do a little presentation and then we're gonna ask some questions and there will be time, I have fallen beneath the camera. There will be time at the end for, uh, questions from the audience, but we do ask that you put those in the chat and we will ask them um, as we go along. So I'm going to turn it over to Luana. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Megan. I am so glad to be back with everyone at the Greenbelt Museum. I tell everyone whenever I get a chance what a wonderful museum it is and to support it. All right. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, this way. This way. Here we go. Here we go. All right. All right. I love it. I love it. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Luana Holland. I am the program officer of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Are you hearing that echo? I am. I am. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's maybe it's maybe me. Let me mute myself. Okay. Okay. As I said, I am the program officer of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, and it is my pleasure to talk to you about the Action Fund and the National Trust efforts to tell the untold stories of our shared American history. The African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund is the National Trust for Historic Preservation's multi-year, now $70 million initiative committed to crafting a narrative that expands our view of history by telling the full story of African American historic sites and promote a national identity that reflects the nation's true diversity. The Action Fund is the largest preservation effort ever undertaken in support of African American historic sites. African American history is American history. And by elevating these stories and places, we look to not only understand our past, but to also create opportunities for dialogue and to form stronger arguments for how to link preservation to the honoring of our ancestors and the honoring of ourselves. We keep places alive through collaboration with and the dedication and perseverance of grassroots advocates, preservationists, scholars, politicians, and the community itself to uncover and make visible these stories that contribute to our collective historical narrative as a nation. To be able to talk about the work of the Action Fund and its purpose is to ask a question that is often asked of me. 
why is the preservation of African-American historic sites and places important? When we speak of place, we speak of memory, of tangible connections. We can walk where they walk, touch what they touched, be where they were. Place allows us to inhabit a moment in time, connecting us to those through lines that link us to the past. But what happens when those moments in time have been obscured or omitted outright? What happens when those stories have not been heard? There's a gap, a hole that becomes our responsibility to discover and peel back those layers within a site to give us a more complete picture of place. Pictured here is Shaco Bottom in Richmond, Virginia, once one of the largest slave trading markets in the United States, second only to New Orleans. This sacred space was paved over a parking lot, its history overlooked and forgotten by so many. Through intervention and our support, this sacred space is not in danger anymore of becoming a stadium or anything else, but a place to remember and reflect as a memorial park and site. I show you this slide to remind you of the climate that inspired the Action Fund's creation. Two of these images being of sacred spaces, a massacre of African-American congregants at Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston, South Carolina by a white supremacist in 2015, the vandalization of the African Meeting House in Nantucket in 2018. The African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund was created in 2017 in response to the events in the center image, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. These are hard, painful images to see. But in the face of such hate, the world needed to know our stories more than ever. We cannot shy away from telling stories that reflect and expose our complex past. We can draw from them and use them to create and shape a better future. The Action Fund has entered year five of our national grant program. We have hit and surpassed our original goal of $25 million. And thanks to a $20 million gift from philanthropist Mackenzie Scott and her husband, Dan Jewett, and another $20 million in funding from the Lilly Endowment for our Preserving Black Churches project, we are now a more than $70 million fund. We hope to continue to draw attention to the remarkable and still largely unrecognized and unheard collection of places and stories of African-American activism and achievement. America has been rich in history, but poor in representing it and funding its protection, conservation, and recognition. Since January 2018, we have vetted over 2,000 project proposals requesting over $190 million and have awarded over $7.3 million to over 200 awardees and projects nationwide. Through our national grant program and involvement in initiatives such as our Historically Black Colleges and Universities Cultural Stewardship Initiative, in partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities, we have been able to see and bring awareness to the breadth of African-American preservation need. It gives us a sense on a national scale of not only the need, but who is doing what? What are the interests? What are the concerns? The Black church has been the center of the Black community. Its role as an anchor and compass essential to our experiences. They are the oldest institutions created and controlled by African-Americans and have been central to who we were and are. Our newest initiative, the Preserving Black Churches Project, seeks to offer a national strategy for historic Black churches nationwide through a new national grant fund and assistance to churches serving as sites of conscience, memory, and reconciliation. 
model innovative stewardship and capacity building for Alabama's civil rights churches and to create a rapid response and emergency grant fund for imminent threats. Its first recipient was St. James Church in Mayfield, Kentucky, which was almost destroyed during the recent devastating tornadoes. A project that's near and dear to my heart right now is the Sojourner Truth Memorial Project. I'm the project manager of this and I'm so excited to be a part of this. With support from the Knight Foundation, we are collaborating with local organizations and community stakeholders in Akron, Ohio, such as the United Way of Summit in Medina, Summit Parks Metro, and the Centennial Suffrage Committee to create a new memorial from concept to unveiling on the site of her 1851 speech at the Akron Women's Con Conference in 1851 with a statue by noted African-American artist Woodrow Nash. We hope to create an innovative, thought-provoking space that will continue to inspire generations to come. Part of reclaiming history is the empowerment that comes with being able to actively support sites, organizations, and outward facing projects that are working to make it happen. This means supporting projects and programming at our National Trust historic sites, such as at the Woodrow Wilson House in Washington, DC, our preservation leadership trainings for organizations, to our fellows who are thinking about how to talk about preservation in new, innovative and creative ways. Funding the American, excuse me, preserving African American places equity, equity report that examined the gentrification and displacement in historically black neighborhoods nationwide and working with Hope Crew, our Na National Trust hands-on preservation experience program that helps to encourage and inspire a new generation to train in the preservation trades. We also, into? we also provide technical assistance for any site or the public to find out more about what they can do to preserve their historic site. It is not enough to say that you want to make a difference. You must actually do it. One thing that I want you to take away is that African Americans are out there doing preservation work from maintaining family and church cemeteries to contributing to building funds, fighting for recognition of historic rural schools for black children or green book sites that hosted performers and black travelers dur during Jim Crow when they had nowhere else to stay. African Americans are doing preservation work even when they are not calling themselves preservationists. That is why it is so special, so important, and so necessary to do this work and be able to acknowledge those efforts. Now I'd like to tell you briefly about our campaign for Where Women Made History that explores the un untold sites and stories of women's achievement. As the last 18 months have brought into focus myriad racial inequities and injustices, so too have they revealed the deep inequities that continue to be faced by women, women of color, indigenous and LGBTQ women. By bringing recognition and respect to women's achievements, honoring the many ways in which they have changed their communities and changed the world and supporting their place-based work in their own communities, we move closer to a world in which women's con contributions are instinctively understood as equal and valued as such. For some context, I'd like to share with you a few concrete examples of the way that we're putting this campaign's goals into action. Just last year, we added four new sites to our national network of historic artists, homes, and studios. Each one of these carefully crafted live work environments highlights the influence of women as artists and educators, 
the Long Island home and studio of multimedia artist Mabel Domico, and the rustic rural California retreat, a Bauhaus ceramicist, Marguerite Wildenheim, are two of these compelling and informative sites. We will continue to expand the diversity and representation of our Haas in the near future with new member sites that feature the work of women artists and artists of color. Over the last two years, we provided nearly $300,000 in grants to fund dozens of projects that bring women to light in a variety of ways, such as a public database of the little known women architects, engineers, and designers who built Illinois to research, identify, and research and identify the places and histories of Latina farm workers and family members whose labor made possible the agricultural industries in Texas and the Southwest. We're also looking at the National Trust's own collection of historic sites, many of which had women in a central role as an owner, client, patron, archivist, or preservationist. Perhaps one of the most famous is the, is the Farnsworth House which from the moment of its completion was publicly and primarily associated with its architect, Mies van der Rohe. In November of last year, we took the critical step of officially correcting that narrative, renaming the site, the Edith Farnsworth House, to ensure that the patron and owner of this modern icon, an independent woman, medical professional and poet will now be squarely at the center of the story where she belongs. Hope Crew has provided hundreds of students with opportunity to learn a skill while helping to repair a historic structure. However, the majority of the participants and trades experts were men, much like the construction and preservation trades as a whole. Construction is one of the only industries where women can achieve pay parity, 99.1% with their male counterparts. And we seek to create a pipeline for women in the trades with all female or majority female Hope Crew projects, like this one in Astoria, Oregon, where we foster a safe and supportive environment for young women to learn hands-on skills like window restoration and plaster repair from women contractors, consultants, and preservationists, and interact with women business owners and property owners. We hope to inspire young women and people who identify as female to envision a career path for themselves through these interactions and shape the preservation movement as the next generation of leaders. And our partnership with Benjamin Moore has directly, excuse me, has directed thousands of gallons of free paint product to help restore four places of women's history, like the Women's Building in San Francisco and the home and studio of Amaza Lee Meredith, a queer African-American woman architect who founded the Fine Arts Department at Virginia State University. The program not only contributes directly to the restoration of these sites, it reduces the maintenance burden for the operating organizations and owners and brings to light the stories of the amazing women, both past and present at each place through powerful short documentary videos produced by Benjamin Moore. Partnerships are key to our impact and our success. And just this month, we're excited to announce that Where Women Made History has formalized a new pilot partnership with the Women's Leadership Initiative of internationally recognized design firm, Ramsa. We will bring their enormous planning and design expertise and creativity to bear on two important places of women's history, such as the Hilltop Home and Studio in Casanova, New York, the holistic multi-acre art environment created by artist, educator, excuse me, educator, preservationist, and conservationist Dorothy Reister. Over the next 12 months, the, where women made history, Ramsa and the selected sites will collaborate on strategic pro bono planning and design services to assist each site in evaluating how they can carry forward the legacies of the women who are inextricably 
link to those places in ways that deepen their engagement with and support of their communities. And thanks to the Friends of the Lion Martin House, where Women Made History also has forged a new relationship with SciArc, one of the nonprofit industry leaders in 3D and virtual documentation worldwide, to capture the recently landmark lifelong San Francisco home of two powerhouses in LGBTQ, civil rights, women's rights, elder rights, and marriage equity activism, Bill Slyon and Del Martin. More than just 3D documentation of a home, this project is exploring the potential for this technology to be a powerful storytelling medium that provides an unparalleled level of public access to and understanding of parts of our history that were, for decades, too often characterized as shameful or illegal. In late March, during Women's History Month, Cy Arc, along with the Friends of Lion Martin House and the GLBT Historic Society, will publicly release this new virtual tour as part of SIOC's Journey to Equal Rights series, giving voice to those who knew and worked with Phyllis and Dow and an opportunity for an entirely new audience to be moved by their long battle to achieve more quality, recognition, legal standing, respect, and pride for generations of LGBTQ people. There are so many stories out there to share so many stories that contribute to the understanding of who we are as Americans, as a nation. I leave you with a question to mull over, think about and consider. What story needs to be heard today? If you would like to know more about the work of the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and the Where Women Made History campaign, and how you too can help tell the full story, please visit our website at savingplaces.org. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Luana. We really appreciate all that information. There's so many exciting projects coming up. Mm -hmm. um, let me see here if we can do... Um... You're still there, right? I never know if I can see what everybody else sees. <laughs> so um, thanks again for that. Like I said, that was really amazing. And uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the line, it sounds like. Um, so bringing it back to um, this immediate area, sort of the, in the DMV area, um, can you tell us about a few of the projects that you've been working on um, that may be close by or that may be coming um, online that, that people here could go see? Well, as part of our awardees, we do have uh, a few that are local, um, such as the Banneker Douglas Museum, which is a gem of a museum in Annapolis, Maryland, um, Asbury United Methodist Church, which is in downtown Washington, D.C., which was associated with the Pearl, which is considered one of the, well, the largest um, mass um, escapes of freedom seekers. Um, in the early 18, the mid 1800s. Um, of course, another one that's also particularly special is the Clifton House in Baltimore, which is the home of poet Lucille Clifton. And um, those are just a few of the over 108 awardees that we have had. And we're, as I said, we're now going to year five of our grant program, which is so excited to see what new places. Um, will come about next. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, you talked a lot about um, various uh, projects that it's obvious that you care a great deal about, including the Surgeon of Truth Memorial. Um, but are there some others in your time there that have really sort of stuck with you, you know, that that you have felt more, um, I don't know, just a, a you may not be able to pick favorites that so maybe like pick favorite hard. child, but um, <laughs> if you can uh, tell us about some that are your, your favorites. Uh, well, part of the technical assistance um, that we do, I, I like to joke that there have been so many times that if you if people call the National Trust and it's in regards to an African-American historic site, I'll, I'll often be the one that gets the call or the email. 
And from one of those calls, I um, was talking to the pastor of Vernon AME Chapel in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm. And he was telling me the story of how their church was the last remaining structure after the Greenwood Massacre in 1921, which utterly decimated the prosperous, the, the just, just so full of, of culture and life community of Greenwood um, in 1921, just burned it to the ground. And Vernon AME was the last structure standing. And what happened was that upon its being rebuilt, the stained glass windows of the church were inscribed with the names of the survivors. And they were contacting me because due to urban renewal um, and the highway construction, of, which bisected the neighborhood, the stained glass windows were now in danger because they were being rattled. So they were in need of stabilization and restoration. And they were like, can you help us? And I was like, yes, Say, yes, yes, we can. And they received our largest award of $150,000 that year. And it just created so much momentum in that they were able to have a stained glass master brought in who came in and looked at it and did the work. The windows are now reinstalled. It was reinstalled in time for the 100th anniversary of the Greenwood Massacre last year. And for me, I, you know, it was all just from a phone call, all from a phone call. Um, another one that stands out to me is the Great Plains Project. And this was actually one of our few that was multi-state. And what it did was that it was looking at and looking for essentially lost black settlements throughout the Great Plains, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, um, just an amazing project. Also, you know, we love hearing about these untold stories, stories you wouldn't think about, such as Maxville Heritage Center in Oregon, which tells the story of black loggers and African-Americans involved in the timber industry. And um, one of our more recent awardees and our, also our first awardee from the Caribbean was Para La Naturaleza, who wanted to reinterpret and examine their African Puerto Rican past and to better interpret their haciendas from the viewpoint and to better tell the stories of the of those who were enslaved there. So those are just a few of, of the projects. And I always have like ones I just love. It's so it really is so hard to pick. And because they're just so, so many are just so amazing. <laughs> I can only imagine it must be hard to choose. I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got to be really, really difficult. Um, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but you know, as as more and more people are becoming aware, um, preservation is not always just buildings. It's it's um, sometimes um, uh, cultural preservation. Um, are there other sort of are there some preservation projects that you have worked on that are more specifically, you know? Um, preserving culture rather than specifically buildings, even though I know it's historic preservation is largely centered around buildings. Well, you know, that's, that's one of the things that when I went into this field, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, old buildings, I love old buildings, I love architecture. But what I quickly found out was that it was, it's about so much more than that, yeah. that these buildings, these structures do not exist in a vacuum, right. that they are part, they're a part of a community they're a part of the fabric of that community, the history of the community, the culture of that community. And so to that end, historic preservation also has to consider things such as gentrification, um, the revitalization of neighborhoods, um, environmental justice, yeah. and how does it affect these communities? So there have been projects such as the Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans Treme Project, mm -hmm. which helped to try to preserve the community that was there because due to not just gentrification but also airbnbs that there was a lot of pressure upon homeowners 
due to not being able to maintain their historic homes. And as a result, they were receiving citations. So it became a matter of what do we do? We can't afford this. So we helped to seed their micro grant program. So we provided the seed money for their micro grant program so that homeowners in Treme were able to put in and apply for this funding to be able to make those repairs. And actually the PRCNO was able to get a moratorium on those citations. Another one that really was, I honestly remember saying, I just want to see what happens here was the Sweetwater Foundation in Chicago created a, a project called the Commonwealth, which has transformed 10 blocks in Chicago. Vacant blocks, blighted properties, and have transformed it into just community gardens, community spaces and gathering spaces. It really is just an amazing project. Once again, also looking at development pressures or the pressures of a community that might not be able to speak up for themselves or make repairs or protect their properties um, was the 10th Street Historic District in Dallas. Um, so they were losing so many properties there due to an ordinance that had been passed that was allowing for demolition of properties that were under 3,000 square feet who was being mostly affected by these properties that were under 3,000 square feet was this African-American historic neighborhood. So we were able to you know, help, you know, help this community in terms of being able to um, help them to stop these demolitions from happening. Um, and then and one of the last but not least of those types of projects to me, um, the Sea Islands of, um, Charleston, South Carolina, and Georgia, have, they are also undergoing tremendous development pressure. I mean, it's waterfront property. And the thing is, is that these sea islands are also home to the Gullah Geechee people who have managed throughout these centuries to retain so much of their African culture that a lot of it is being lost. And we don't want that culture to be lost and one of the grants that, actually two of the grants that we provided this year were to um, projects in the Sea Islands, such as Sapelo Island. The width and breadth of all these projects is really, uh, is really inspiring. It's pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, you, you talked about this a little bit as well, but um, just, just to ask for a little more, um, a little more exploration of, you know, how do you how do you advise sites that are really struggling with contested or controversial history? I mean, you know, there's no, I don't think there's a wiki how to page you know, about, you know, navigating some of these really, um, you know, polarizing uh, uh, moments in history. Um, how do you how do you how do you, you know, how do you handle that? You don't shy away from it. You have to come to it with truth and acknowledge the pain. Um, listen to those who say that there is hurt here, there is trauma here. Um, these places act as tan they're tangible reminders um, and they're tangible reminders and act as places of memory and that must be acknowledged and um, reclaimed um, despite opposition to their stories even being told in the first place. But they can also be places of reconciliation and healing and future healing. So, you know, it's not a matter of shying away or not talking about it. It is a matter of acknowledging that pain, acknowledging what has happened here and telling that story. We, we cannot ignore these stories just because we are uncomfortable. We have, we have to acknowledge painful pasts for what they are. Thanks for that answer. That was really great. Um, and it's clear that you've been dealing with a lot of 
you know, contested and controversial history, yeah. <laughs> uh, which, you know, is debatable whether or not it should be controversial, but I know that um, mm. in some places it still is. Um, uh, one of the other things that, um, you know, I think in, in my mind anyway, um, because of your unique position and, and having this, um, this sort of um, zoomed out view of all these projects happening across the US, um, you know, could you say what is the single most important thing uh, that can help to save and preserve sites that interpret these underrepresented groups? Or is there, is that, is there no such thing? I wouldn't, it's hard to say a single thing. Um, I would say if anything, you have to be able to identify them in the first place. So often these are places, as I said, that have been overlooked, they're missed, often because of the fact that those outside of the culture might not know what to look for in the first place. And the stories are there, these places are there. And so often these types of spaces have fallen almost outside of what we have traditionally considered worthy of being preserved in the first place. And for that reason, it's so important to be able to get in there and identify and evaluate them and say, okay, this place is important because that's how you lose these places and should never reach a point of loss before we realize, oh, this place is special. That was another question that I thought of while you were talking. So I'm, I'm sorry to spring this on you. <laughs> but, but what about those, what about those heartbreaking, uh, you know, projects or sites that, that couldn't get the funding together or that, you know, um, tried hard and the pressures of development were too strong? Um, you know, are there, are there programs in place to try to um, document uh, and preserve what was there? That is always, it's, it's such an internal struggle within our field because of that. And that's usually our course of action. So many times, you know, things become done deals and those places are lost, they will be lost. And there's nothing that really can be done. Even sometimes even we can't intervene and save them. And as a preservationist, you want to save everything. You want to save all these places. And then sometimes you realize, oh my God, I, I can't save them all or, oh my God, this one's being lost. I can't believe this is being lost. How, how is this happening? And the thing is, only thing you could try to do is to get in there. And as you said, document them, document this place so that future generations can at least know it existed in the first place. And of course, it's never ideal that you don't have the actual structure there that you're just looking at a marker that says, oh, this place used to be there. You want the place to be there. But all too often, as we all know, sometimes places are lost. And you know, it's always, you know, a loss for us as well. But the best thing that we can do is to try to at least, you know, acknowledge the fact that it was there, document it somehow. Um, another question that occurred to me as you were talking, uh, you know, what are you seeing in terms of innovation amongst, um, you know, saving Black history sites or some of these other underrepresented groups? I mean, sometimes people who have been marginalized, you know, have such a different perspective that there's there's such creativity there, you know, um, because of that history. What are you seeing in terms of uh, innovations in some of these sites? Well, one thing I've, I've been seeing is and they've always been there, is that you have so many grassroots organizations, you know, that spring up, that one person, that one person that makes a difference, um, who is just like, I'm going to save this site and I'm going to do everything I can. I've seen that over and over again, that one person can make a difference. So, you know, you have these grassroots organizations that are working to save these sites or to band together and network amongst one another to share ideas, to share experiences, to share best practices. Um, you see these individuals doing the same, you know, and one thing too is that thanks to technology, it has become even easier than ever for that to happen. So to me, that's been one of the biggest things is that it isn't just those of us who are considered trained preservation practitioners who are out here doing this work, you have those who are out there as grassroots or grassroots folks who are doing this work as well. That's one of the biggest things 
that I've seen and I think definitely has to be acknowledged. That's great. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, if people have questions, uh, please do put them in the chat and I will relay them to Luana. Um, one question that is there, and I know this is a topic that's near and dear to your heart, and I'd love it because I know um, about some of your work in this area. Um, can you talk a little bit about cemeteries specifically? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the questioner mentions that we have Moses Cemetery locally in this area. Um, and if you could just, you mentioned it a little bit in your presentation, but there are unique challenges, uh, of course, with, with cemeteries and particularly with cemeteries where there are um, people who have been marginalized, uh, buried. I love cemeteries. Um, you know, Megan, you're so right. You, yes, you know, they're dear, near and dear to my heart. Um, every year with our national grant program, I'm always, there's always one cemetery. I'm like, I want that cemetery um, every time. Um, to me, cemeteries, you know, they are the resting places of our ancestors. But for our community, for the African-American community and so many other marginalized communities, a lot of times our resting places are often subject to vandalization, neglect. Um, you just find this over and over again. I, I have had people who have been like, Luana, it's privately owned and we can't get access. And I'm like, no, you should be able to get access. There are so many issues and factors, but what I've also been finding over and over again is, is the whole smaller groups, grassroots groups, you know, that one person saying this cemetery is worth cleaning up clearing up and you know i've told people establish a friends group go out there and see which if you feel this cemetery needs to be cleaned up and repaired form a friends group get out there make it happen um i just feel like cemeteries is just truly one of my favorite topics and areas in terms of preservation because of that fact and it tells so much cemeteries tell you so much within themselves of the history of a place um, one of my favorite that we gave an award to was um, God's Little Acre in, <laughs> in Rhode Island. It's, it's just this beautiful little colonial era cemetery because often, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't often think of something like a colonial cemetery for African-American. So cemeteries truly are near and dear to my heart and one of, one of my favorite things to uh, talk about. <laughs> I know that's true, and I know you've spent um, many weekends working on uh, your own family. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, so many people do that work. They go out and they they're clearing their family cemeteries and cleaning the headstones and making everything nice. And guess what, people? That's a form of preservation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, does anybody have questions that they would like to put in the chat? This is the time. Well, we have one here. <laughs> Um, you touched on this a little bit, uh, but um, just going back to it, I'd love to hear more about efforts uh, to achieve environmental justice in some of the places across the country. Um, you know, uh, as we all know, you know, so many times um, people who have the least means are affected the most by some of these environmental disasters. So um, what are some of those projects like? Well, one of the things that is such an issue is because historically, um, black communities were often relegated to these spaces and places no one else wanted. And often those places and spaces that no one else wanted were subject to either natural, um, natural occurrences such as flooding or just, just, just the worst, their swamp <laughs> essentially. Or they were, or there's later subject to having something industrial placed right next door, landfills, factories, plants, because there was, there's an assumption of what are they going to do about it? And, you know, looking at things like that, you know, how do you, what do you do in terms of helping African-American communities? And in our case, you know, our thoughts are definitely of historic African-American communities in terms of trying to writing, the, writing this wrong. Um, for instance, we had, um, we had a cemetery and that, you know, we were just like, oh my goodness, because it was affected by flooding due to 
nearby overdevelopment. So those are the kind of things we um, have to really take into account and think about going forward. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I can imagine um, how complex it is in some of these in some of these environments. Um, there's a question uh, here. Locally, we had a Negro League baseball exhibit. Uh, local museums now going to be housed in a public library in the Baltimore area. Uh, can you tell us of some other multi uh, cooperative efforts where there's real, um, you know, cooperation amongst different entities? Oh, wow. Um, there are so many like that, <laughs> actually, because you find that with a lot of projects, it's not just the organization, that they might be working with local universities, they might be working with local institutions such as um, museums or um, community organizations and organizers, or you'll find the local governments or state governments are involved. So, you know, with so many projects, it's almost good to have that extra support in place. It's something I know we encourage that, you know, we want, if you're a project, we want you to get that university involved, get the community involved. So, you know, having all of these other players come into play, it only benefits a historic site in the end, I think, to do so. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, I'm also really uh, interested in, um, you talked about this as well, but just if you could, if you could talk just a little bit more about it, um, the efforts to preserve uh, LGBTQ history. Um, I know that you uh, mentioned them in your in your talk, but what are are there are there any unique challenges um, to saving sites related to that history? Well, like so many histories, you know, it's one that it has untold stories, mainly because it's often been intentionally hidden, whether for the protection of those involved, whether it was the time period where or it may have even been felt it was dangerous to be out. So in so many cases, these, these histories were hidden, but they are so integral to those particular places, to the persons who may have lived in those places, in those communities, that you have to tell these stories. Um, I know, Megan, you and I were once at a conference where they were talking about how the family was burning, <laughs> burning items of their family member as the preservationists were coming in and people were talking about having to essentially run out with the box in their arms because the family was trying to burn it as they were trying to collect it. So, you know, you're, you're, there are so many battles in terms of fighting against telling this story versus something like a family who doesn't want that story to be known. So that's, that's definitely, you know, one of the challenges that you face in terms of LGBTQ histories, but they are stories that need to be told to tell the full story of that place and of that person. Does anybody else have questions for Luana? Um, you talked more about, um, or could you talk more about things that average people can do? Um, you left your presentation with uh, directing people to the, um, uh, National Trust site, saving, <laughs> saving, what, I, why am I blanking on what it is? Savingplaces.org, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, you directed people there, but, um, you know, are there ways that people can help to bring some of these local history sites, these sort of smaller hidden sites, um, bring those sort of up to the surface? Well, you know, a lot of um, projects that I've seen it's a matter of talking to the community. It's a matter of talking to the community, finding their stories, not talking at, but with. And oral history projects, collecting those stories of those who have, may have lived in this community for years and years. Those were all history projects, you know, tell so much about the place and about the community and about the people who were there. Um, so that's definitely one thing that can be done. Another, of course, is you know, to support those organizations that do the work. 
support your community museums, you know, support those organizations, the preservation organizations and projects that are out there thinking about this and implementing this and doing this work. Um, if you have a place that is meaningful somewhere that you think others really need to know this story, let others know that story. <laughs> Whether you're putting it out there in the world through social media, that counts. Tweeting about it counts. Putting it on Instagram counts. Making a TikTok about it, it counts. That's a way of getting those stories out to an audience who may not have otherwise known that it existed. Supporting the supporting organizations that do this work is so incredibly important. And right now, you know, we've been going through this pandemic. So much has been upended, particularly within, within historic sites, period, in terms of visitation, in terms of being able to go out and do the work. So, of course, you know, we can only hope that going forward as things start to pick up again, that, you know, you'll be able to have that support. But in the meantime, you can definitely make those stories known. Like, tell people about it. Tell people. Um, yeah, it seems like that's that's one of the main the main ways is just to sort of um, publicize, publicize or, or amplify, you know, if you hear of um, stories that I need to be told. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, is there anything else you want to, you want to add anything you forgot to talk about or? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of these, you know, we've been talking about the Action Fund and we were talking about where women made history, but, you know, I can actually talk about sites that are essentially an intersection of the two. We have so many amazing sites related to African American women, um, such as the Mary and Eliza Freeman houses in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We're talking about um, Anta, two sisters in Antebellum, Connecticut, who become the richest women in town. <laughs> they took advantage of this new fangled invention called the railway <laughs> and essentially became real estate moguls in their town. And so, you know, we gave them an award because their houses are still standing. And one wonderful thing about giving this award is that often the sites are able to leverage it even into even more money. So they were able to leverage, I believe we gave them $50,000 and they leveraged it to $1 million. And I was just, I remember when I first met, I was just like, wow, what? That's amazing, yes, because that's what we want. That's what we want. A lot of our sites have um, told us that through getting this award, it made people sit up and notice it gave them a seat at the table. It made people pay attention to them in ways that they had not before. Um, another of those sites, Harriet Tubman's home and in Auburn, New York, I think people often, we think of her as, in such, as such an icon that we forget she had a family. She, she was married, lived to be, you know, and she lived to be quite, you know, an old woman and people forget she had this this long life after her amazing deeds um there's the home of Polly Murray um who is um part of the LGBT community um fantastic lawyer civil rights advocate just amazing I believe she has a documentary there's a documentary out there about her right now if you can catch it please watch it it's wonderful um there's the Omaha Star in Nebraska, which was owned by an African-American woman. It's the African-American newspaper. Um, one of our most recent finalists of the awardees was the Georgia B. Williams Nursing Home in Georgia, which tells the story of African-American midwives. Um, there's the Marian Anderson Museum devoted to, you know, the noted opera singer, the League of Women for Community Service in Boston, which is notable because that is where Coretta Scott King stayed while she was studying at the conservatory in Boston. And while she was dating her 
future husband, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was also studying in Boston. And there's the Sarah Rector Mansion in Kansas City, which is a story of essentially the richest little girl at the time who became wealthy because she received land and oil was found on it. And these are just all just examples of really fantastic, wonderful stories that so many people didn't even know about related to African-American women. And um, for me, it's just such a privilege and honor to be able to do this work and to share all these stories with you. It's clear how enthusiastic you are about it. It's infectious. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if there aren't any more questions, we will let you go. Um, unless there's anything else you want to add. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here uh, tonight and um, uh, look for information about our next talk. Again, we're going to try to do that in person, uh, but it will also be recorded. So we, we're hoping to, um, if you can't get in because it's a limited amount of people, uh, we will, um, you'll be able to catch it on our YouTube channel. Uh, or possibly on Gate TV. Uh, and there's uh, still several more days left in Black History Month. So um, I encourage everybody to go and see uh, Greenbelt's Black History and Culture Committee. Uh, their, their offerings have been amazing this month and there's a couple more left, I believe. So you can go to the city website and access that, or you can go to the Greenbelt Museums uh, on our website, just click on the blog and it's a few entries down is the program that they put together. Um, so thank you so, so much, Luana. This has been amazing. Oh, thanks and, for having me. I'm yeah, glad to be back. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great to have you back. Um, you know, you should never be a stranger here. Um, and uh, this talk uh, will also be available on the Greenbelt Museum's YouTube page. Uh, we have a couple other of our lectures there as well, and we're trying to put more content up there um, all the time. So I will go ahead and um, say thank you very, very much. And uh, we'll see you um, in the future. Thanks. <laughs> we stopped recording here.